Dry and warm afternoon across southern Scotland with sunshine hazy at times, perhaps turning a touch breezy later in the afternoon, but daytime highs reaching the mid-twenties. A dry and sunny afternoon for Northern Ireland, breezy along the east coast and away from the onshore wind, feeling very warm in the sunshine with highs into the mid-twenties. Fine, dry and very warm across much of the UK Sunday evening, although remaining breezy along some coasts, and that is how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Hello and welcome, this is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, DAB and online. Today we've got absolutely loads to discuss. I'm asking whether or not we really need Indie Ref 2, a referendum for Scottish independence. First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, is still very much determined. We'll get the thoughts of a former SAS trooper about claims the SAS killed detainees and unarmed men in Afghanistan. Throughout the show, I'll be joined by the writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters, but first, here's the news with Simon Pusey. Good afternoon, it's two minutes past two. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB Newsroom. Train companies are advising people not to travel over the next two days as forecasters predict extreme temperatures. Avanti West Coast has updated its advice to travel only if absolutely necessary, while London North Eastern Railway is urging people not to travel at all on Tuesday. The Health Secretary has said extra measures are being put in place for ambulances with an amber extreme heat warning in for most of the UK today and the UK's first red alert for tomorrow and Tuesday. Tuesday, covering a large part of England. Record-breaking heat in Europe has sparked deadly wildfires across the continent. High temperatures and strong winds are fueling the flames. At least 90,000 acres have burned in Portugal, most of them in the past week. Thousands of people are also being evacuated in France and Italy. The French Environment Junior Minister says similar conditions have been felt all summer. It's an especially difficult summer. We are dealing with very considerable drought due to insufficient rainfalls over the winter and spring, an especially dry month of May, and now we have particularly high temperatures, as you can currently feel. The Cabinet Minister, who led last year's UN Climate Change Summit, says he could resign if the next Prime Minister is not fully committed to the net zero agenda. COP26 President Alok Sharma told The Observer some of the remaining candidates in the Tory leadership race had been what he called lukewarm on the emissions target. He urged them to set out their support for the net zero strategy and green growth. The second televised leadership debate will take place later tonight. 
A man found dead in an Italian hotel room has been named as the former professional rugby player Ricky Bibby. He was discovered yesterday morning next to a seriously hurt 43-year-old woman thought to be his partner. She's being treated in hospital while police in the city of Florence continue their investigations. Bibby played professional rugby for more than a decade, including at a time with the Wigan Warriors, until an injury forced him to retire in 2012. A Ukrainian cargo plane carrying military equipment has crashed in northern Greece, killing all crew on board. The Antonov aircraft was travelling from Serbia to Bangladesh when it came down near the city of Kavala late last night. Serbia's Ministry of Defence says the plane was carrying 11.5 tonnes of products made from within its industry. Greek authorities say there were eight people on board, with Ukraine's foreign ministry confirming they were all Ukrainian citizens. The government has announced all schools in England will have a defibrillator by the end of the next academic year. State-funded schools will be reviewed to see how many devices are needed. The number is estimated to be more than 20,000. Research shows accessing a defibrillator within three to five minutes of a cardiac arrest increases the chance of survival by over 40 percent. First deliveries are expected by Christmas. The Culture Secretary is urging video game companies to better prevent children from making in-game purchases. Nadine Dorries believes so-called loot boxes should only be approved by a parent or guardian. A government review says young players who've bought loot boxes might be more likely to have gambling, mental health and money issues. Around 1.3 million families across the UK are thought to be facing the cost of living crisis with no savings. New research has found in the period leading up to the pandemic that nearly half of families across Britain had less than a month's income stashed away. The Resolution Foundation says while some will rely on friends or family to bail them out, some believe they'll simply be unable to cope. Marks & Spencer is the latest retailer to get rid of best before dates from their stock in a bid to reduce food waste. From this week, the retailer will scrap the dates from many fruit and vegetable products, replacing them with a code that m and staff can check to use the freshness and quality. It follows Tesco that scrapped many best before dates four years ago and Morrison's earlier this year, encouraging customers instead to do a sniff test before throwing food away. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. It's back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Cheers, Simon. Welcome, folks, to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up on the show. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has said she wants to meet the next Prime Minister for talks over her plan to hold an independence referendum next. Yeah, does this woman ever give up? I'll be asking, should Westminster actually let them? My good friend Dame Arlene Foster, birthday girl, she joins me on the show in the midst, of course, of the Conservative leadership race. I'll be finding out from the former First Minister of Northern Ireland what she wants from our next leader. And before three o'clock, we'll discuss a BBC investigation that found SAS operatives in Afghanistan repeatedly killed detainees and unarmed men in suspicious circumstances. The BBC found evidence suggesting that the former head of special forces failed to pass on evidence to a murder inquiry. The Ministry of Defence said British troops served with courage and professionalism in Afghanistan. So that's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, though, your gob is much more important than mine. I'd love to know your thoughts on a second referendum for Scottish independence. Some of you are crying out for one, and that's in England. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of crack and content on our page. Cheers. <laughs> Now, the Conservative Party leadership election is, of course, heating up. And the blue-on-blue -blue action is getting hotter than the cost of fuel, with arguments over taxation, debt and gender self-ID. It looks like it could get into the debate around immigration, a necessary and important one. But one area I actually reckon is essential to discuss is the net zero debate, with four out of five of the candidates uncritically accepting the policy. I'm afraid to say, folks, that those leadership contenders that promise the cost of living crisis is their number one priority aren't being honest with you about the trade-off required. Thanks to this legally binding policy of Theresa May's and the Green Extreme. You see, I reckon the net zero target acts as an asphyxiating straitjacket. It 
It's bound around the body of Britain. And the prices at the pump, your food shop, your energy bills and elsewhere are but a trailer of the horror that net zero will ultimately prove to be, in my opinion. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a few examples from around the world that I think give us an indication of what could happen here in Britain. In Sri Lanka, thousands of angry protesters stormed their president's vast residence and set the prime minister's house on fire. Civil unrest is taking place after power cuts, schools shuttered and dwindled supplies of fuel to the point where people can't buy it, food and medicines. And in April of last year, the Sri Lankan government imposed a ban on the import of fertilisers and pesticides, telling their nation's farmers that they must go green and organic. In seeking to appease the big nations by worshipping their green gospel and offering up their farmers like sacrificial lambs, Sri Lanka has suffered the consequences, a shattering impact on its ability to feed its people. Their leadership spoke of being in sync with nature to the technocrats at COP26, the UN climate conference in Glasgow, full of private jets and discussions around how best to immiserate those much poorer than them. The World Economic Forum that championed the art of the lockdown, that started, of course, much of the world's inflationary strife, advocated that Sri Lanka move to organic farming, pushing its people into poverty. And we're supposed to sit here and have smiles on our face like Cheshire cats and wait for it to happen here in Blighty. Closer to home, in Europe, protests took place that were heard precious little about. Dutch farmers used their tractors to dissent against the government and the EU technocrats, pushing at them targets to half the use of nitrogen compounds by 2030. This means farmers have to get rid of loads of their livestock, destroying livelihoods. Construction projects have also been placed on hold because of the target too. And our Australian cousins, a little bit further away, their previous government, a Conservative coalition that also enshrined the net zero by 2050 target into law, saw voters opt instead for the real deal. Green Party politicians or independents standing on eco-extreme platforms. When Conservatives try to out Labour Labour or out Green the Greens, people ask why they shouldn't just vote instead for the genuine article. And look, climate change is occurring. But in a country like Britain or Sri Lanka, Britain, of course, emitting less than a tiny 1% of global CO2 emissions, yet we're willing to cross our fingers and hope that reducing our access to energy, heat and food will end up being a sensible idea. If you ask me, this is the people versus the privileged who delude themselves into being seen to do the right thing at their dinner parties and political rallies. Frankly, it makes me sick. Candidates like Tom Tugendhat talk a good game on the, the defence of the realm in his pitch for the top job. But I'm telling you now, there is no surer a way to hand control to the likes of Russia on gas than by refusing to extract it ourselves. It's under our feet right now, folks. There's no more certain a way to give power to the likes of China by ensuring the West doesn't help the world's developing nations with their energy needs. You cannot have global security without access to cheap and plentiful energy that enables human flourishing. At a time when a spell of hot weather, also known as summer, acts as an excuse for the green extremes to demand further damage and action, I fear, folks, if we continue down this path, of the pursuit of net zero by 2050, we'll see similar such revolt against a global elite that spends too much time in Davos and not enough time in Darlington. If you ask me, politicians ought to take note of the failure of green utopianism. Now, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has called for talks with the next Prime Minister over her plans to hold a second independence referendum next year. She said whoever replaces Boris Johnson would have absolutely no democratic endorsement from Scotland. 
The last referendum took place in 2014, when voters backed remaining in the UK by 55% to 45%, after being told by both sides that it was a once-in-a-generation vote. So should Westminster acquiesce to the First Minister? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by three of Scotland's finest. The former chairman of Stirling Conservatives, Alistair Rowe, former SNP councillor, Austin Sheridan, and the political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail, Michael Blackley. Michael, can I start with you, please, for some overall analysis? Could you just break down the latest developments on IndyRef2 and what Nicola Sturgeon actually needs to do in order to obtain it? Yes, I think what is happening just now is that while Nicola Sturgeon is trying to indicate progress in her push for an independent referendum, it actually seems to be a bit stuck in the mud. Um, so this morning we heard from two of the Conservative leadership candidates, their view hasn't changed really. Um, they're pretty insistent that they're not going to grant a Section 30 order if they become Prime Minister. Um, Nicola Sturgeon had a press conference on Thursday and she was really trying to use that to give the indication that things are progressing, but in actual fact, she wasn't really telling us anything new. So um, at the moment, it, it really seems pretty unclear what the next step is going to be in her push for, for a referendum. Yeah, I mean, Austin, do you not think, come on, hand on heart, be serious for a second, do you not think that whilst we're going through a period which is going to define this generation as far as inflation is concerned, is now really the time to talk about so-called independence, which, by the way, isn't end independence at all, is it? Because you want to sign up to every rule that the European Union would give to a so-called independent Scotland. Now, now it is exactly the time um, to be discussing the future because what we do know um, is that remaining part of the UK, we know we're not going to get access to the EU, which Scotland voted to remain in. Uh, we know that inflation is going to get out of control. We know that we're facing hardly any, if any, economic growth. Uh, the future of the United Kingdom um, is in dire straits, and it, and, and it is fundamentally due to the mismanagement um, of the Conservative government. But hang on a minute. Fundamentally, hasn't voted for. If Scotland does have debt problems, who's been in charge? Well, as Scotland has a Scotland massive deficit, a no? Scotland, yeah, and Scotland gets a lot grant, and, and, and those financial um, powers lie at Westminster. I mean, Scotland doesn't create a deficit. It's the Westminster government that creates a deficit. But okay. in, terms of countries, in terms of countries being in debt, um, I mean... Countries being in debt is a normal thing. I mean, as we've seen in the Tory leadership, they, they spoke about, about the debt and they spoke about, about borrowing. It's actually about how you manage those things. That are right. really important, having the economic levers. So, Alistair, you guys advocating that Scotland stays in Westminster, you're just wanting to keep Scotland shackled to the Union. The point is, Darren, and it's a very, very important point, is that now is not the time for a second independent referendum. Scotland, along with the rest of the United Kingdom, is just emerging from a global pandemic. And let's face up to it, and Austin's talking complete nonsense. Uh, for many, nearly all the areas of responsibility that the Scottish Government have, we've seen a total collapse in, in, uh, in competence. Education, the, uh, the uh, literacy gap is continuing to widen. They're not meeting their a &E, uh, targets on health. Uh, on transport, we've had a ferries fiasco where, where the Scottish Government can't even organise the, the competent and efficient delivery of two ferries. And on justice, and on just this very, very important topic, we've seen many women, many girls, having to abandon cases of rape and sexual assault because of delays and access to justice in Scotland. You know, this is, a, this is a government that has no competence whatever. So, Michael, what are the polls actually telling us? Are the polls saying that Scotland is crying out for this referendum, that Nicola Sturgeon goes on about more times than a priest does the gospel? Well, I think what is quite interesting in some of the recent polling is that actually 
support for independence hasn't really changed that much since 2014. In, in many ways, everything that the SNP could have possibly wanted to happen to boost the case for independence since then has happened. Um, we've had a, a leave vote, which the, the SNP has tried to capitalise on. Um, we've had Boris Johnson coming into Downing Street, the Tory bogeyman, as the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack said, that the, the SNP tried to try to portray him as. Um, so everything has happened that the SNP could have wanted to boost independence, but yet things haven't really changed in the polls. And I think what is quite interesting as well on polling is that there seems to be no real appetite for Nicola Sturgeon's timetable to have another independence referendum by the end of next year. At the moment, there's fewer than a third of Scottish voters say that they agree with that timetable. So um, there's maybe a bit of a split on still on the yes, no question. But when it comes to whether a referendum should happen, it seems that it is the vast majority of, of people in Scotland don't really want to go back to that kind of argument at the moment. Yeah, divisive as it was, I remember it well. Austin, you must yeah. be of the view that you can <clears throat> see exactly what the SNP are up to here. The SNP, like a rat running down a drain, know that their time is almost up. They've had failure after failure. They know that now is the only chance they're going to get. Well, I'm of the view that it should always be up to the people of Scotland to decide when Scotland has the next referendum. Uh, Scotland elected a, the largest pro-independence majority of parliament since it was established, re established in 1999. Um, and it's not up to any politician to really stand in the way of the will of the people. I mean, what we need in Scotland is a democratic route to a referendum. And if, and if we keep being blocked, I, I, even though the SNP have won every single election in Scotland since 2010, if we keep being blocked for a referendum when people are consistently voting for it, I mean, I mean, really, we're going to have to start turning the question over the Tories and saying, well, what is the democratic route? Okay. I mean, I'm, imagine the EU have, um, have blocked the Brexit referendum. I mean, do you really think people in the United Kingdom would have stood for that? Well, you've got all those laughs to come for if you do vote for independence. The EU will absolutely love that, but there we are. Anyway, we're going to have to end it there, folks, but Michael Blackley, Austin Sheridan and Alistair Orr, thank you very much for your time and your views. I've got the writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters with me now. Charlie, you went to uni in Scotland, you went to Edinburgh University. How much, first of all, how much does the union actually mean to you? And secondly, do you see, I get people watching this channel saying to me, Darren, look, if they wanna go, let them go. Sure. And is this what the SNP ultimately want? Well, yes, if you badger someone enough and you pester them relentlessly with this miserable chat, eventually you'll tell them to go away, right? And it, I mean, I remember when I started at Edinburgh University, uh, England played away at Scotland I think the weekend I went up there and uh, all the England fans were chanting, we're all voting yes. They had enough, right? They had enough of the Scots belittling us and taking us for granted, quite frankly. But I'll take your first question. How, what, is, what does the union mean to me? It means enormous amounts. I mean, this is our cultural national heritage and we should absolutely be defending it. And the idea that this once in a generation vote, I mean, I know that the SNP has denigrated life expectancy in Scotland extremely, but you know, uh, once in a generation isn't 10 years. So um, it, it's, it can't be allowed to happen. It just cannot be allowed to happen. And I'm crying out for Conservative leadership to actually treat Nicola Sturgeon as a political enemy, not a foreign emissary, and say no and, and have some strong stance on this. Absolutely, because, I mean, my fear, one, is that if they do actually get their way, the SNP get their way, there's a Scottish independence referendum and actually they vote yes. I don't have confidence that any Conservative leader would approach those negotiations like Michelle Barnier did for the United Kingdom yep. post-Brexit. Yep. I actually think we'd be saying, all oh, right, never mind your debt burden. Mm. England will pay for it all. Yes, absolutely. We just heard from your last guest about the debt burden being Westminster's fault, which is a ludicrous statement. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Scotland's debt is now £36.3 billion. Pounds. It's more than doubled in the last 10 years. It's worth over 22% of GDP, which is double the average rate for an advanced economy. So, in short, Scotland is economically crippled and it relies on the tax, the tax revenues of England to sustain its failing governmental model. We can't allow that to continue. We cannot. We'll come back to you, Charlie Peters. Thank you very much for your thoughts there. 
Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we're going to be joined by GB News' very own birthday girl, Dame Arlene Foster, to give her thoughts on who should like to be the next Conservative Party leader and, of course, Prime Minister. But first, let's have a look at the weather without the scaremongering with Simon Pusey. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most of us, and it should stay warm in the late evening sunshine. Let's take a look at the details. It's a dry end to the day in southwest England with plenty of sunshine. It will be slightly breezier around the coast, but feeling warm inland. Southeast England will hold on to plenty of sunshine this evening. It will feel warm late into the evening with light winds, staying dry also into Wales to end the day with lots of very late sunshine, a thin layer of cloud that will turn the sunshine hazy at times. A fine end to the day across the Midlands with light winds and evening sunshine. It will feel rather warm this evening with temperatures in the mid-20s. Skies will be a little cloudier though in northern England, although there will be some sunny breaks at times. Staying warm this evening but feeling fresher on the coast. Largely cloudy to end the day in Scotland with some patchy rain in the far north. Warmer weather will hang on in the south tonight, but feeling cooler elsewhere. A dry end to the day also in Northern Ireland with hazy sunshine. Winds will be light with temperatures in the high teens. Staying warm for many places tonight ahead of a very hot day on Monday. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. To Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Now, as you know, Boris Johnson won in 2019 with the promise to get Brexit done. But if you're living in Northern Ireland, Brexit's far from complete. You're still under the auspices of the European Court and the single market. And that's created a border where none existed between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A part, let's not forget of our union. And the vast, vast majority of the EU's checks now take place there. And if you ask me, that's a total outrage. So what does the former First Minister of Northern Ireland, Arlene Foster, want to see from the new Prime Minister to break the current political deadlock in her homeland? She joins me now. Arlene, first of all, I have to say a very happy birthday. 
Yes, thank you, Darren. I'm a birthday twin of the Duchess of Cornwall, although she's a little bit older than me. I hope you recognise that. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it's a delight to be on with you today. And can I say uh, your discussion thus far has been severely lacking from the Conservative leaders debate, and that, of course, is the union. And uh, you were speaking there about the threat posed from the SNP. Uh, and of course, I will speak, as I always do, about the Northern Ireland and the fact that we have this internal border created by the protocol between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And there is the, the real need to deal with that internal border and get it sorted out. But unfortunately, we haven't heard very much from any of the uh, Conservative candidates thus far. I think Liz Truss is the only one who has specifically referenced the Northern Ireland protocol so far. And I would really like to see not just the protocol been mentioned more, but the United Kingdom and the union and the vision for the union going forward, I think that would be something that not only Conservative members would like to see, but certainly it's something that we would like to see here in Northern Ireland as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. But Arlene, just to give our viewers a refreshing update, a bit of a refresher there, could you explain where Boris Johnson actually has left the, the protocol? Where are we at with sorting it out? So the protocol, uh, of course, was one of Boris's big mistakes. I would say probably his biggest uh, mistake. Uh, agreeing to an internal border in the United Kingdom was something uh, that he should never have done. But he wanted to get Brexit done, as he described it. And in order to do that for Great Britain, he allowed this border down the Irish Sea to materialise. He will say that he never believed that it would happen in this way, but it has. And ever since uh, it was put in place, um, the government, our government, have been trying to negotiate with the European Union to deal with the very fundamental problems that it has caused. Uh, the EU have said, no, no, uh, the protocol can't change. It's like the law of the Medes and Persians. It's unalterable, uh, which, of course, is not true, because if you look at the text of the protocol, it envisages uh, amendments and replacements being added to the protocol, uh, and, and therefore uh, it should be dealt with because it causes trade diversion. Uh, it causes um, societal unrest here in Northern Ireland. And, of course, because of the protocol, we now don't have institutions. We don't have a, a stormed executive up and running and the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is probably at its lowest point it has been in uh, my memory. So we need to sort it out uh, and Boris recognised that. First of all, there was the paper which came, the command paper which came forward when David Frost was in charge of Brexit negotiations. Uh, he brought that forward uh, to try and deal with the European Union in a proactive way. They, of course, came back with blank faces and said that they didn't have a mandate yeah. to negotiate. Uh, and now we have the protocol bill, which is currently in committee, um, which we hope will deal with some of the worst excesses of the protocol. So what I want to hear from these candidates is, are they going to continue with the protocol bill in its current form uh, so that we can deal with some of these difficulties? So are you optimistic then that, and I'm assuming that you've got some rough indication, Arlene, of, of which leaders would be more likely to, you know, say to the EU, well, we're absolutely not carving out one part of our United Kingdom. Do you actually believe that any of them have got the bottle? I think David Frost, I would have liked to have seen him stand, Arlene. I don't know about you. Well, I mean, I think Liz Truss has been pretty consistent uh, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rishi Sunak has been consistent in the other direction. You will recall back in October, Darren, when there was a hope that Article 16 uh, was going to be uh, triggered under the protocol so that we could get down to real negotiations around this issue. Rishi Sunak uh, and the Treasury resisted that. Uh, within cabinet and it didn't happen uh, and of course the rest is history because we got into a spiral around uh, the vote on own Patterson and Partygate and what have you uh, but uh, I think he's probably the one that I would be uh, least enthusiastic about when it comes to the Northern Ireland protocol and as I say the one who has been clear now uh, has been uh, Liz Truss I think Kemi uh, Badenoch would also be pretty clear on this issue, although I haven't heard directly what she mm -hmm. has to say on the protocol bill. Um, and I haven't heard too much from Penny Mordaunt or Tom Tugendhat either, but I understand Penny Mordaunt did not vote uh, on the second reading of the protocol bill. Yes, and of course that dreaded backstop, Arlene, remember that? I think that was part, 
when Penny was part of the Mrs May government. But we're going to have to leave it there. Arlene, thank you very much for your time. And I hope you're, after this, going to get yourself a nice glass of something bubbly. <laughs> thanks, Darren, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks. Now, I'm joined in the studio by the writer and broadcaster, Charlie Peters. He's still with me. Do you have any, uh, do you view the, basically the full set of Conservative leadership candidates as lily livered? Do you think any of them have got the bottle to actually stand up to the EU and say we're not going to continue with this protocol? Well, much of it comes down to personality, really, when you think about it. Who do you trust to stand strong in a negotiating room with people who are acting, you know, opposed to your interests? Now, we've seen some of these leadership debates so far, the one on Channel 4 a few nights ago, certain people who are standing for the leadership are quite keen on being quite wishy-washy, flim flam with their views. And Penny Morden, I mean, no one knows what she actually stands for in anything, let alone this protocol which she, you know, was part of pushing through. Um, and, you know, with Mrs May's premiership. So I think I have belief and hope that a strong person like Kemi Badenoch, with very clear principles, very clear conservative vision, could stand up for this country in that kind of discussion. And I'm mildly concerned that too many other ones either don't believe in the union enough to want to stand for it, and even if they do, they don't have the strength and personality to stand up for it when it's required. Yeah, Charlie Peters there letting us know that actually the Conservative and Unionist Party appears to have forgotten the Unionist part of its name. But folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. Next, we're going to be discussing the BBC Panorama investigation that was broadcast this week. It suggested that SAS operatives in Afghanistan repeatedly killed detainees and unarmed men in suspicious circumstances. But before we get into that, it's time now for a check on the news headlines with Simon Pusey. Thanks, Darren. It's 2.34. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB Newsroom. People are being advised to travel only if it's absolutely necessary until Tuesday. Train firm Avanti West Coast have updated their advice following extreme temperature forecasts over the next two days. The health secretary has said extra measures are being put in place for ambulances with an amber extreme heat warning in for most of Britain today and the first red alert for tomorrow and Tuesday covering a large part of England. Europe continues to be gripped by the extreme heat wave, with fires raging through northeast Italy. Firefighters have been battling wildfires over the weekend. One broke out near Rome, with flames reaching the town centre, forcing families to evacuate as a precautionary measure. Rivers and reservoirs are drying up across the country, adding to the worst drought the country has seen in 70 years. Temperatures are expected to hit 42 degrees Celsius in many north Italian cities next week. A man found dead in an Italian hotel room has been named as the former professional rugby player Ricky Bibby. He was discovered yesterday morning next to a seriously hurt 43-year-old woman thought to be his partner. She's being treated in hospital while investigators try to figure out what happened. Bibby played professional rugby for more than a decade, including a time with Wigan Warriors, until an injury forced him to retire in 2012. The cabinet minister who led last year's UN Climate Change Summit says he could resign if the next prime minister is not fully committed to the net zero agenda. COP26 President Alok Sharma told The Observer some Tory leader candidates had been what he called lukewarm on the emissions target. He urged them to set out their support for net zero and the second televised leadership debate will take place later tonight. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News.
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, a former SAS soldier, Harry McCallion, has accused the BBC of an obscene smear against his old regiment after a Panorama programme claimed that the SAS sent in death squads that carried out unlawful killings of detainees and unarmed men in Afghanistan. The military police have asked those involved to show, to, to share information that they gathered so they can assess whether it amounts to a war crime. The Ministry of Defence, meanwhile, responded by saying that British troops always served with courage and professionalism in Afghanistan. Here to give his reactions to this story is another former SAS trooper, Phil Campion. Hiya, Phil. Thank you oh, very well, much yeah. for your company. Yeah. Do you agree, then, with that line from the Ministry of Defence that have said, look, our lads have always acted with the utmost professionalism? Absolutely, 100%, I agree with that. And from what I know, from what I've seen and what I've heard, all right, and <laughs> there's nothing to the contrary. You know, this whole thing has been absolutely blown out of all proportion. The very fact that they've used the word death squads said to me from day one they had nothing. Yeah. Where, where are these death squads? Because in all my time in Hereford, I, no, no one ever said to me, right, who's going to be in the death squad? Where's this word come from? Yeah. I, it, they made it up, haven't they? It sounds good, doesn't it? Death squads. We've got death squads. Now, the SS had death squads. We've got the SAS. Do you know what I mean? There's no death squads here. So would you agree, then, that this is an obscene smear? A absolutely. An, an unfounded one as well. You know, when you looked at the programme itself and broke it down, they had an Australian signaller, all right? Well, to be quite frank, our guy's laundry probably went further into battle than he did, so he, he never saw nothing, right? OK? So we can, we can discount him. They had some colonel or other from the Marines who wasn't part of their unit as well, all right, OK? They then had some Taliban. I mean, if I, if I went anywhere the British Army had been in the world and went and spoke to our enemies, all right, they'd probably say, well, yeah, they weren't very nice to us, OK? And they'd come up with some story and try and get the upper hand on us. So all they've got is hearsay, complete hearsay. There's nothing, there's nothing found. So from my point of view at the moment, I'd like to see an investigation the other way. I'd like to know why, when the MOD have asked them not to to present something like that, OK, unless it's founded in absolutely solid concrete, why have they been allowed to do that? Why have they been... Look, Phil Shiner, and I'm sorry if I'm taking your thunder a little bit, Phil Shiner, OK, he did the same thing. On Panorama again, funnily enough, OK, so Panorama, Phil Shiner, here we go, we've definitely got the Brits this time, they're in trouble, I'm going to smash them to pieces. It went, it rolled, OK, and they got them. And my friend Brian Wood got in a lot of trouble, OK? And then all of a sudden, oh, actually, that's not too credible. This didn't happen, that didn't happen, who was he? Uh, and then all of a sudden, now Shiner's in court and he's getting done, all right? He's, he's already been found guilty. So is he's that what be... you're predicting is going to happen this I, time? I can't see BBC, anything else but... Have the I BBC can't... got a case to answer then? I think the BBC have got a case to answer. Yeah, let's turn it on its head. Let's say, hang on a minute, you've had your chance, you've had your say. Nobody that's commented... You know, the RMP guy wouldn't get out of the car. We haven't seen his face. Who are you? Do you know what I mean? So they've... they've, put, they've, they've presented nothing which I couldn't have found on the internet or made up myself. And they've manufactured words like death squad. Oh, death squad. So then is it your view, a lot of my viewers may well be of this view as well, that the BBC have actually forgotten the British part of their name? Absolutely. Absolutely they have. They've in no way, shape or form embraced anything that our forces have done over there. We made it an extremely safe place. You know, special forces over there saved lots and lots of lives with their actions, OK? They've not mentioned that, have they? They've not said that there would have been a lot more deaths, there would have been a lot more guys coming back in boxes, a lot more limbs coming off, and a lot more carnage if our troops hadn't been doing what they've done. They haven't sort of like looked at that side of the thing. All they've done is they've raked through the coals, 
to manufacture something that, again, will make us look poor. All right? It's ridiculous. And it's always the, it's always the regiments that they sort of, like, deem are the prestige regiments that they go and target, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So the BBC, though, would say, look, it's right that independent journalists hold the armed forces to account. Would you argue that's not what... No, 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 if they've got something that's solid. If there's something genuinely afoot, if there's something wrong, then, yeah, I think we all want to see it. But there wasn't. They've raked through the coals, they've added two and two together and come up with 16. They've got nothing. It's ridiculous. And yet they've still presented it. The MOD have said, we have looked into it ourselves twice, not just once, twice, all right? We've looked at it twice, all right? And we found nothing wrong with it. And they've still gone ahead. They've still forced the issue. And like I say, from day one, you know, they've not... They've, not, they've, they've admitted so much detail. If you had all this paperwork, well, what squadron was it? What troop was it? They've said none of that. If they had have had something that was credible, they'd have said straight away it was such and such a troop, such and such a squadron. They got nothing. It's so then, insane. in the context of Afghanistan, we're looking at a broader picture here. Obviously, what we did there, what we established there, as you rightly yeah. pointed out, those fundamental foundations, the building blocks, I mean, it's worth note now, is it? The, the, what eventually happened in Afghanistan and the withdrawal and all that sort of stuff, which, by the way, I found shocking, do you yeah. know what I mean? We absolutely had no choice but to take part in what the Americans did, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that was a shock in my leave. We didn't achieve nothing, no. We gave them stability for a very long time. OK, we've rolled over and rolled out in the end, all right? But the lads and lasses that served over there gave 100% commitment. They acted with pure... You know, bravery in, in, in many cases. You know, they gave, they committed some of the best years of their lives to trying to sort something out over there. They just haven't received the support back here. They should have been coming back heroes. Everybody should have been applauding them. They should be first in the queue. They should be receiving the care. I met a lad the other day, part of that, part of the um, Shiner thing. You know, he's got no legs left from Afghanistan. All right, same unit as, as that. Okay, it's insane. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's looking into that. Nobody's saying, you know. And you mentioned the fact that, you know, people, of course, did come back home in boxes. People actually yeah, lost I their did. lives, mothers and fathers, you know, yeah, children still lost, to this Children day. Lost, lost parents, Definitely. parents lost sons. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's horrible. Nobody ever... Why would we be trying to beat those people up unless we had something that was firm? So then in the context of that, how do you reckon those parents or indeed children will be feeling if their, you know, their loved ones didn't come back Looking at the picture of Afghanistan now, and of course, married with the fact that you've got the BBC saying things like I this, I think there'll be some very sore feeling. But I think that, and I'd love to, I'd, I'd, I'd love to sort of like offer to those people and say, look, they didn't die in vain. They, 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 they did, they did exactly what was required of them. Okay, at, at times they didn't get the, iron, <laughs> the backing from the ivory tower and all that sort of stuff. Okay, but they did the best that they could. And for a very long period of time, Afghanistan did have stability. Women were allowed to do things, and all the, all the stuff that we set out to try and achieve was happening. All right, it's it, it, it's gone it's gone sour towards the end, but their efforts won't won't certainly have been wasted as far as I'm concerned. And then Phil, I'm wondering, you mentioned there about the fact that once the Americans pulled out of Afghanistan, there was no we could do right. That was it. We had to withdraw with them alongside. Them. Yeah, we could. We, uh, <laughs> but do you reckon that that raises a more fundamental question, really, about the fact that our armed forces currently? Can it actually sustain a war? No, I think, right, so if you look at Afghanistan, and my, I'm a bit sort of like far down the food chain to be commenting, and I'm probably going slightly above my pay grade here, right? OK, and I'll be honest about All that. Right. But if you look at things like mission creep, you know, we started off, we got rid of the Taliban initially, and then we sort of like crept out, and then we went here, then we went there, and then we sort of like started getting broader and broader. So there were probably, at the very top, mistakes made, all right? That's war, OK? No, no, no battle ever survives the first contact. It always gets, ends up something different to what it started. I get that, OK? So it, it, the whole thing's been a very difficult thing from start to finish. Mm -hmm. But to say that people didn't achieve anything and to certainly lay into them when they get home is, is absolutely disgusting. Yeah, and I guess you would say to the BBC, look, you try life in a war. I'd say to the BBC, you get yourself on the front line, you try and do that job, and you can come to me for your payment for your TV licence because I ain't paying it no more. I've, Absolutely is that not. You done? No, I'm done with them. I don't watch them anyway. They, they, you know, they tried to get me on the on the news night the night they aired that. Absolutely no chance. All the tea in China aren't coming on your program. And, and you what know, did you think of those that did appear on the program? Again, you know, they were offering stuff. They, it, it was all veiled. It was all hearsay. There was nothing substantial. So you got to question why they were on there. Did you need the dough? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't want your dough. It's filthy money, as far as I'm concerned. I'd, I'd, I'd sooner sit outside with nothing than take their dough. 
I think a lot of people are turning away from the BBC, and I think this will just give further ammunition to that argument. You've got to question why you're paying them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Why should I pay you? I don't even watch you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do what everybody else has to do. Go and earn a living. Go and put your back out. Go and do something that actually, you know, achieve something. And then you might not have as much time to rake through the coals and try and drop everybody in the plop. Phil, mate, I'm <laughs> going to read out what the BBC have said, the BBC's reply, the MOD's reply even. Now, the Ministry of Defence <laughs> said it couldn't comment on specific allegations, but that declining to comment should not be taken as acceptance of the allegations' factual accuracy and that British forces served with courage and professionalism in Afghanistan and were held to the highest standards. Phil, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for coming into the studio, though, and discussing that with okay. you. Now, it's 2.48 and calls by an opposition councillor for a government-led public inquiry into child sexual exploitation in Oldham were defeated at a town hall meeting this week. They were rejected by the Labour-run council during a fiery meeting that saw local residents shouting from the public gallery. It comes after a recent report found children were failed by the agencies meant to protect them from abuse. Well, joining me now is the Conservative councillor Robert Barnes, who described the council's decision as a travesty, adding that it was the night that democracy died in Oldham. And he joins me now. Robert, thank you very much for your company. Could you just explain what last month's assurance review into child sexual exploitation actually discovered and why you and other councillors wanted a government-led inquiry? What it found, Darren, was that there were failings by Oldham Council and Greater Manchester Police. And we don't think that the assurance review went far enough. The terms of reference were too narrow and were set by Oldham Council. And we think it is now time for a public inquiry where the matter is taken outside of the council and we want to see it as a government-led inquiry. The public Indeed. want to see a, uh, want to see an inquiry, Darren. Indeed, that is and what I, we're pushing for. I think a lot of people are very, very angry about the fact that this has happened. But what would you actually say to the Labour Party? What do you think they're thinking? Their rationale behind saying no to this inquiry? Well, I'd be saying to the Labour Party, why are you blocking democracy? Why are you? You are meant to be, you're all meant to be corporate parents. You're all meant to look after vulnerable children and adults. And by blocking a public inquiry three times, you are letting down vulnerable children and adults in, the ta in, in our town. And I, I, I really do think, what have they got to hide and who are they protecting? It really isn't acceptable that for, on three occasions, Labour councillors have blocked the opportunity for a public inquiry into child sexual exploitation and grooming gang gangs here in Oldham. Could you just set they have the scene? To answer, they have to answer to the public, Darren. Yeah. Set the scene for my viewers on the, the way in which this vote went down, because you had, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had local residents watching from the public gallery, right, who were absolutely livid yes. with the council's decision. What do you reckon the, the reaction has been in, in Oldham as a whole? What happened on the night was a motion was laid and that motion was completely changed by the Labour administration and it stripped out all reference to a public inquiry. That is why the public in Oldham were angry. That's why you saw the level of anger in Oldham. Because Oldham, because the Labour Party in Oldham don't want to have a public inquiry. They think this is good enough and it isn't. And it's not just the first time it's happened on the 27th of June. There was a special meeting, an extraordinary meeting of the council, uh, in which I also spoke. That, and I said, I said, I said to them, "This is not the start. This is not the be this is not the end. This is the beginning." And the anger levels are only going to rise until the Labour Party realises they've got to deliver on what people want, and that is okay. an independent inquiry. And I'm not the only person calling for this, Darren. Well, I'm just going to read you out what the council leader Amanda Chatterton, who moved the amendment, said. She says, yeah. we want to see improvements for children and young people and see the people that committed these disgusting crimes brought to justice. The original motion doesn't explain what benefit at all a public inquiry would have, either providing improvements to our assurance for today's children and young people or seeking justice for historic victims of abuse. What's your response to that? 
I think Amanda, Amanda Chatterton is running scared of what a public inquiry would uncover, because that is what we want. And under Section 1 of the Inquiries Act 2005, if there's enough public concern or interest, then a minister can call for a public inquiry. And I would appeal to the current Home Secretary, Priti Patel, or whoever takes her place, and to the current uh, and to the remaining five, mem five MPs who are running for Prime Minister, to instigate a public inquiry, come to Oldham, and let's have that public inquiry. Because the terms of reference need to be widened, and they shouldn't be set by the local council, because people wouldn't have trust in that. OK. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for your time. That was the Conservative councillor, Robert Barnes, there, who, of course, tried to get through that public inquiry. Now, folks, it's 2.53, and there are concerns that the hit reality show, Love Island, is given an unrealistic view of sex and relationships. Personally, I'd rather have a drink on a night than watch whatever that is. It's been accused of heightening young people's self-consciousness with its interpretation of what sexiness and suggestion that there is a right way and a wrong way to have sex is. So here to tell us more about this is the entertainment correspondent and writer, Rebecca Toomey. Rebecca, thank you very much for your time. Do you think that Love Island does give an unrealistic view of sex and relationships? I think what Love Island actually does is that it reflects what's going on in society. It's a mirror image of sort of popular culture and what's going on with the younger generation. So while people like to point the finger at Love Island, Love Island is really just reflecting what's going on on a much wider scale. And when it comes to sex and sort of people's identity with sex, it's really sort of just showing this Instagram generation. The islanders are people that were kind of told, you're the most attractive in the country because you've been selected for this show. And what, where they come from is that if you do certain things, you become sexually attractive. If you go to the gym regularly and have a six pack, if the guys have tattoos, if the girls you know, have larger breasts, these sort of you know, very cut and copy sort of looks. And then when it comes to sex as well, this generation, it's very much, if you do X, Y will happen. So what we saw recently on Love Island is, is the girls were sort of doing very provocative stripper style moves, very confidently for sort of quite young women, you know, some of them are only 19. And they weren't quite getting the reaction that they wanted from the guys. And it was quite a shock and, and quite sort of uncomfortable viewing to watch them be so upset because they've always been told, if you do one thing, you'll get X amount of likes on Instagram. And I think what they sort of not realise is that it doesn't work in the real world. When you're trying to have an intimate relationship with someone else, as we all know, it's not as easy as inputting a few numbers or doing a few things and getting a certain reaction. And that's where it's sort of showing that, you know, our young people are probably not as sort of mentally secure as we think they should be because they just don't have the capabilities to understand the nuances of, of, of kind of normal relationships. And also they've got so much anxiety about their bodies and the way they look. And I think Love Island is just sort of reflecting, as I said, this Instagram belief that you have to look perfect and you have to look the same. And there's only one way to be physically or sexually attracted to people, which just isn't true. Right there. And I think it is a damning indictment, actually, on the state of play in the country that people think a genuine career for them is, would be to, mm. you know, have sex on national television and show goodness only knows what, right? I think a lot of my viewers find that profoundly de depressing. It's really depressing. And I think what's more depressing is the thought that actually your only way to be able to buy a house at the moment as a young person is to go on a reality show and make money very quickly through social media. Because I think, you know, the outlook is quite bleak for a lot of people, but particularly young people, the job market isn't the way it used to be. We're headed for, if we're not already in it, a big financial problem. So the prospect of working hard, studying and getting a job and buying a house doesn't necessarily lead to, you know, a, a normal career route doesn't necessarily take you there. So when okay. it comes to Love Islanders, you can see it's elusive to go on a reality show and achieve these things. Having sex on camera is, you know, something I think people will very much live to regret, as we've seen in other versions of Love Island, other series, yes. and things like Big Brother as well. I mean, Michael, God knows what Michael Owen is feeling right now. I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> but that was the entertainment <laughs> correspondent and writer, Rebecca Toomey. Thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, you're watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. He has the weather.
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most of us, and it should stay warm in the late evening sunshine. Let's take a look at the details. It's a dry end to the day in southwest England with plenty of sunshine. It will be slightly breezier around the coast, but feeling warm inland. Southeast England will hold on to plenty of sunshine this evening. It will feel warm late into the evening with light winds staying dry also into Wales to end the day with lots of very late sunshine, a thin layer of cloud that will turn the sunshine hazy at times. A fine end to the day across the Midlands with light winds and evening sunshine. It will feel rather warm this evening with temperatures in the mid-20s. Skies will be a little cloudier though in northern England, although there will be some sunny breaks at times. Staying warm this evening, but feeling fresher on the coast. Largely cloudy to end the day in Scotland with some patchy rain in the far north. Warmer weather will hang on in the south tonight, but feeling cooler elsewhere. A dry end to the day also in Northern Ireland with hazy sunshine. Winds will be light with temperatures in the high teens. Staying warm for many places tonight ahead of a very hot day on Monday. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Hello and welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, DAB and online. Today we're going to be discussing whether the online safety bill should be scrapped altogether. Plans for new internet safety laws have been put on hold until a new PM takes office. As the UK braces itself for record temperatures and a hell of a lot of scary sound and rhetoric from certain broadcasters, I'll discuss whether it's right to raise concerns over rising temperatures or is it being blown out of all proportion. And can we rely on the NHS? Ambulance response times are at an all-time high in England with an average wait of more than 50 minutes. But first, let's have a look at the news with Simon Pusey. Thanks, Darren. I'm Simon Pusey. It's just gone three o'clock in the afternoon. Train companies are advising people not to travel over the next two days as forecasters predict extreme temperatures. Avanti West Coast has updated its advice to travel only if absolutely necessary, whilst London North Eastern Railway is urging people not to travel at all on Tuesday. The Health Secretary has said extra measures are being put in place for ambulances, with an amber extreme heat warning in for most of Britain today and the first red alert for tomorrow and Tuesday covering a large part of England. 
Record-breaking heat in Europe has sparked deadly wildfires across the continent. High temperatures and strong winds are fueling the flames. At least 90,000 acres have burned in Portugal, most of them in the past week. Thousands of people are also being evacuated in France and Italy. The French Environment Union Minister says similar conditions have been felt all summer. It's an especially difficult summer. We are dealing with very considerable drought due to insufficient rainfalls over the winter and spring, an especially dry month of May, and now we have particularly high temperatures, as you can currently feel. The Cabinet Minister, who led last year's UN Climate Change Summit, says he could resign if the next Prime Minister is not fully committed to the net zero agenda. COP26 President Alok Sharma told The Observer some of the remaining candidates in the Tory leadership race had been what he called lukewarm on the emissions target. He urged them to set out their support for the net zero strategy and green growth. The second televised leadership debate will take place later tonight. A man found dead in an Italian hotel room has been named as the former professional rugby player Ricky Bibby. He was discovered yesterday morning next to a seriously hurt 43-year-old woman thought to be his partner. She's being treated in hospital while police in the city of Florence continue their investigations. Bibby played professional rugby for more than a decade, including time with the Wigan Warriors, until an injury forced him to retire in 2012. A Ukrainian cargo plane carrying weapons has crashed in northern Greece, killing everyone on board. Drones are being used to survey the wreckage near the city of Kavala. It was carrying 11 tonnes of weapons, including landmines. The cause of the crash is reportedly due to an engine problem. Eight people died. The government has announced all schools in England will have a defibrillator by the end of the next academic year. State-funded schools will be reviewed to see how many devices are needed. The number is estimated to be more than 20,000. Research shows accessing a defibrillator within three to five minutes of a cardiac arrest does increase the chance of survival by over 40 percent. First deliveries are expected by Christmas. The Culture Secretary is urging video game companies to better prevent children from making in-game purchases. Nadine Dorries believes so-called loot boxes should only be approved by a parent or guardian. A government review says young players who've bought loot boxes might be more likely to have gambling, mental health and money issues. Around 1.3 million families across the UK are thought to be facing the cost of living crisis with no savings. New research has found in the period leading up to the pandemic that nearly half of families across Britain had less than a month's income stashed away. The Resolution Foundation says while some will rely on friends or family to bail them out, some believe they'll simply be unable to cope. Marks & Spencer is the latest retailer to get rid of the best before dates from the stock in a bid to reduce food waste. From this week, the retailer will scrap the dates from many fruit and vegetable products, replacing them instead with a code that m and staff can use to check freshness and quality. It follows Tesco that scrapped many best before dates four years ago and Morrison's earlier this year, encouraging customers to do a sniff test before throwing food away. And the Queen and Duke of Duchess of Cambridge have been wishing Camilla a very happy 75th birthday. William and Kate shared photos with birthday tributes on Twitter, along with Buckingham Palace, who also released an official photograph of the Duchess of Cornwall to mark the occasion. It shows Camilla sitting, smiling at a garden table. The picture was taken last month in the gardens of Camilla's retreat in Wiltshire. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. Back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up. The online safety bill's final stages were set to be discussed in Parliament this week, but there's reports plans have been put on hold until a new Prime Minister is put in place this autumn. Labour say this is an absolutely devastating blow and another example of the Tories prioritising their own ideals over people's safety online. With the delay, is it time for the government to scrap the legislation altogether? We'll have the debate. We'll also be looking at the UK gambling reform white paper. It's been shelved for the fourth time. It's another disruption due to the leadership challenge within the Conservative Party. And ambulance waiting times have hit a record high. The services are under intense pressure with record numbers of call-outs and the most urgent Category 1 calls last month. The Department of Health and Social Care said they recognise the pressure staff are under. I'm going to be asking how long they can keep going like this. 
That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, your mouth is much more important than mine. What are your thoughts on the online safety bill? Are you worried about the free speech implications? Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of crack and content on our page. Cheers very much. As I say, the final stages of the new online safety bill were set to be discussed in Parliament this week. But there are reports that it's been put on hold until a new Prime Minister is put in place this autumn. The bill aims to lay down rules in law about how platforms should deal with harmful content, putting the responsibility on tech firms like Meta, who own Facebook, and Alphabet, who own Google, to monitor content. Firms that fail to comply with the new rules could face fines of up to £18 million, or 10% of their annual global turnover, whichever is the highest. The bill isn't without its controversy, with campaigners expressing their concerns over the impact on free speech. So with the legislation delayed, is it time for the government to scrap the bill altogether? Well, joining me now to discuss this is the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young, and the Secretary of the UK's Children's Charity Coalition on Internet Safety, John Carr. John, turning to you first of all, what would your message be to the five leadership contenders for the Conservative Party leadership and, of course, ultimately Prime Minister that may well be thinking about scrapping outright the online safety bill? Well, at least one of the candidates, Penny Morden, has made it clear that that's not her intention should she be the successful candidate. But can I just say, uh, since this, in the 2010 Conservative Manifesto, the 2015 Conservative Manifesto, the 2017 and the 2019 Conservative Manifestos, promises were included about making the internet a better and safer place for children. This bill is substantially uh, near the end of its time in the House of Commons. It's yet to go to the House of Lords. In fact, there was only one more day left on it. And if it hadn't been for the Tory party leadership elections, uh, it would have been through and finished the Commons uh, this week. So, it, it, but the truth is, it may not be much of a delay, because if, uh, if it was going to, it was only going to start in the Lords on the 9th of September, if it's really the case that the Conservatives will have selected a new leader, we will have a new Prime Minister on the 5th of September, we may not have lost much time at all. And that is what I sincerely hope turns, that turns out to be the case. OK, so, Toby, turning to you now, you have written about this time and time again, saying that you've got really serious concerns around the free speech implications of this bill. Could you just set out what they are and then address the point made by John on the fact that this bill actually seeks to protect children. Yeah, Darren, um, uh, to John's point, I don't think um, anyone uh, who's been campaigning against this bill uh, because of their concerns about free speech um, is concerned about those aspects of the bill designed to protect children from harm. Um, I think everyone on both sides of this argument accept that something needs to be done uh, to strengthen the protections uh, for children and to make sure they're not exposed to harmful content. The problem I have with the bill is that it goes far beyond that. And in particular, it seeks to protect adults from legal but harmful content. Um, and in the indicative list that the government has published of what would be included in the legal but harmful to adult stuff uh, would be things like misinformation, health-related misinformation, harassment, and our concern is that censorship on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter is already enormously extensive. And we see again and again those platforms using um, their anti-misinformation um, and anti-harassment policies to, to stifle legitimate subjects of public debate. I can't tell you how often, Darren, gender-critical feminists have contacted the Free Speech Union to say that they've been banned from Facebook or Twitter because um, they say they simply said that they disagree that trans women are women or that trans women should have access to women's refuges and be able to compete against women in women's sports. That is often classified as harassment or Facebook or hate speech uh, by Twitter in particular. And we don't want to see the government uh, empowering 
social media platforms to become even more censorious and um, even more energetic enforcers of what has effectively become progressive dogma. Uh, that's so the really worrying stuff about this bill. If we can take that out, then I'm sure many of us um, uh, wouldn't object to it coming back in the autumn. So, John, would you accept that? Would, do you personally have any concerns about arming Mark Zuckerberg with the ability to say, your speech is legal but harmful, I'm going to ban you from my platform? Uh, well, he's already effectively doing that. and they're all, all of the internet platforms are doing it to some degree or another. I mean, if there's, if there's one good thing about this bill uh, in, in that regard, it is that it intends to lay down transparent rules. And once you do that, those rules will be uh, transparent and justiciable. So if Toby or indeed anybody has, a, has an argument about the way they're being interpreted in a way which harms free speech, for example, that matter can be resolved in the court. I, I don't know, I don't have a dog in that fight, if you see what I mean. The central point of this legislation was always meant to be the protection of children, right? From 2010, at least, as I said, the Conservatives have been making promises to do it. Um, and it's just a pity that at this very late stage, this delay has been uh, introduced. Now, as I said, it may turn out to be nothing in practice, because okay. whenever we have a new prime minister, they'll simply recommence the bill. It's only got one day left in the Commons, and then it goes to the Lords. Um, and that's how it should be. Um, let me just remind, remind you, by the way, uh, we had a, a piece of legislation before, after the 2015 uh, general election of 2015 Tory manifesto that actually became law. It, it passed all the way through the Commons, all the way through the Lords, it became law, and then on the 19th, uh, 16th of October 2019, Nicky Morgan stood up and said, we're not going to implement it, we've changed our minds, even though it was already the law. So this is a mess of the Conservatives' own creation, and it's putting children in jeopardy. We've so been at this for 10 years or more. Yeah. 10 years is okay. almost two generations of children, and it's, it's just not good enough. Toby, then, do you recognise, you've already said that, you know, something obviously has to be done in order to protect children on the internet. But then how has the bill ended up mothballing into this, what it is now, this, this behemoth that it is, with, where you've got Tory titans like David Davis saying that this bill is the biggest accidental curtailment in modern history. Is it accidental? No, I don't think it's accidental. I think the reason um, so much has been uh, put into this bill, which started off with, you know, perfectly good intentions, I think, to, to better protect children from harm. It's now mushroomed into something far more extensive than that. Um, and I think the reason for that is because um, officials in the Department for Culture, Media and Sport have seen an opportunity to try and assert more control over the internet. Uh, th I think there's a kind of fear, a residual fear um, within the metropolitan elite, uh, within the bureaucratic class of ordinary people having an opportunity to express themselves in a way which is unregulated, which they can't control. And I think this is an attempt for the, for, to, to wrest back control of this, uh, what they see as a wild west. But I think there are two, to, to John's point, I think there are two good reasons uh, why this bill's been put on hold. The first is that several of the candidates, including Kenny Badenoch and uh, Liz Truss in the Conservative leadership election, have said they don't think the bill should go forward in its present form. So it seems crazy to railroad it through, given that either of them could be prime minister um, in the autumn. But the second reason is there are lots of things in this bill which suggest it hasn't really been properly thought through. I'll give you just one example, Darren, but this is something not, not many people are aware of. Even John may not be aware of it. One of the clauses in the bill says that Ofcom will be tasked with making sure that any content that is illegal in any part of the United Kingdom uh, will have to be removed from these um, in-scope service providers like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. So that means that if something's illegal to say in Scotland, then no one in the rest of the United Kingdom will, will be permitted to say it online. Do we really want to outsource content moderation for the whole of the UK to Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP, the most authoritarian political figures in the current UK political landscape? That just seems crazy. And I think it's just an oversight because the bill is so poorly thought through. Yeah. And, and John, that will raise significant concerns with my viewers who may well be thinking, 
goodness gracious me, whatever I say online that someone deems to be harmful to them, right? I could say I'm offended by much that The Guardian publishes, but I don't think I'm going to go around reporting them for legal but harmful speech. These sort of things, right, are we just becoming far too, as Toby said there, we're moving in this more authoritarian direction. And actually, we just need to grow up, find the laudable aspects of, of children protections online. Great. But when it comes to speech, this bill actually says that journalists have a right to free speech, but ordinary people don't. Well, I think part of the point of the bill is to bring these matters in, into clearer view. The, the truth is there are thousands of internet platforms at the moment. Each of them has got their own terms and conditions. Each of them have got their own policies, their own procedures, their own moderators, and they're all making individual decisions in ways which are, are, are completely opaque. So it's entirely possible that people's free speech rights are being suppressed now, and we just don't know about it or have no way of, of measuring it. Uh, and so one good thing, from the, if, we, if we want to stay on this free speech uh, dimension, is that there will be a set of regulations and rules that will be laid out and transparent, and that ultimately the courts will be able to take a view on. And, and bear in mind, we are still subject to the European Convention on Human Rights. We are still signatories to a whole raft of, uh, uh, of human rights laws which incorporate free speech provisions and so on. So if there are any provisions of this bill, that uh, contravene those, those laws, then the courts can make that clear and the law can be amended accordingly. Okay. Can I just make one other point? Just very briefly. Very, very quickly. How, how, how many women don't speak in public places? How many ethnic minorities and people from marginalized communities have withdrawn from Twitter and other platforms because of the harassment and because of the, 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 the constant barrage of trolls and so on that are there? If this bill can help limit that to some degree or another, that's got to be a good thing. OK, I'm going to let my in-studio guest, Charlie Peters, come back to that point. So I'll say goodbye to you guys, Free Speech Unions, General Secretary Toby Young and John Carr. Thank you very much to the two of them. Charlie, I can see you're absolutely seething by that mm. point. Do you, do you accept that actually the internet is becoming a hostile place to minorities and actually this bill will... We'll sort that out. Absolutely not. The, the is already illegal. Harassment is already illegal. If you're forcing someone off a platform with abuse, that is already a crime. What this bill is seeking to do, and what MPs are chomping at the bit to do, is take free speech as it sadly is in a perilous state already in Britain and dirty it even further. We already have a range of laws that make it difficult for you to speak freely in Britain. The Communications Act, the Malicious Communications Act, the Public Order Act, all of these things define speech in offensive ways. And the difference with the Online Safety Bill is that it will change offence from intent to a receipt. So if you feel as though you've been offended, that can be your case. That can mean you take someone to court, that can get someone censored. That is a very dangerous shift. And I also want to remind your viewers of the horrible murder of the MP Sir David Amos last year. Mm -hmm. Now, this attack was carried out by an Islamist. But the reaction was a completely boggling movement everyone start talking about online hate. This is a hobby horse of so many MPs who are trying to turn any opportunity, any crisis, as an opportunity for them to clamp down on freedom of expression in Britain, and we must resist it. I couldn't agree more. Because I tell you what, I'll be having one or two court cases myself if mm. this comes through, I imagine, because <laughs> I offend people at every given opportunity. I open my mouth, Charlie, and some people are offended. But anyway, there's plenty more to come, <laughs> folks, this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, it's not only the online safety bill that's suffering from the Conservative Party election. Reforms to gambling have been shelved for the fourth time. I'm going to have Christopher Snowden, the head of lifestyle economics at the IEA, to give his say. But first, let's take a short break. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. 
At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m.? Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, the UK gambling reform white paper has been shelved for the fourth time. Another disruption due to the leadership challenge within the Conservative Party. It's had more iterations than the sugar babes. There's reports the paper would include strict affordability checks on gamblers to elevate the risk of people finding themselves in financial difficulty. But the gambling industry has claimed that such proposals would wipe billions of pounds from their revenues. A spokesperson for Gambling with Lives, a charity that was set up by parents whose children took their own lives after suffering from gambling addiction, said tens of thousands more people will be harmed and more will die as a result of this inexcusable delay. So why has this paper been delayed for a fourth time? Well, joining me is the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the IEA, the Institute of Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden. Chris, thank you very much for your time. More iterations than the sugar babes. Why is it that this paper keeps coming and going? Oh, just because the, the the government's fallen, basically. You know, everything's been delayed now. Everything's everything's up for grabs. It is quite possible that if we get one of the more based candidates in the leadership contest becoming prime minister, they'll ditch the whole thing, and they have every right to do that. You change your prime minister, you can you change your policy. I mean, it's almost the point of changing uh, a prime minister. So yeah, it's not just this. Everything is is currently up for grabs it's not being deliberately delayed or postponed and actually we don't know anything about this uh, this this white paper it's all rumor at this point it hasn't been released the government hasn't said anything about it the anti-gambling people are quite keen to say that it's going to include affordability checks and the ban on advertising sponsorship we don't know that we don't know what the government's been thinking we don't know what the last gambling minister thought let alone what the next one will but in the last discussion, I don't know if you saw it, I've been discussing with Toby Young and someone from an yeah. uh, internet safety campaign. And actually, the direction of this government, Chris, it strikes me, is one of, of patrician Toryism, right? It's, it's, it really is paternalistic. It wants to try and protect us all. And actually, I find it uniquely patronising. Am I wrong? 
Uh, no, I agree with you completely. But, you know, what do you mean by this government? Do you mean Boris Johnson's government? Boris Johnson's government. Well, government? Theresa May's government, yes. Mordens or Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss government. You know, things change and things will change when the Prime Minister changes. And this is something for Conservative members to think about. I have no idea what any of the leadership contest candidates think about gambling. I'd quite like to know. These are the kind of issues that uh, that obviously interest me. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not just that they're patrician, it's that they capitulate to single-issue pressure groups. I don't really think there's any reason to have this gambling review. We had, you know, in the last 60 years, we've had the 1968 Gambling Act, which regulated gambling for a very long time. Then we had the 2005 Act. And I don't think we really need any more. The justification for a new piece of legislation has been, well, now we've got internet gambling. Now people can gamble on their phones. Well, yeah, but we had that in 2005. Yeah, not on smartphones, sure. But I don't see what the connection is between affordability checks on gambling and advertising bans on you know gambling advertising. What's the connection to that to the internet? There's nothing to do with the internet. It's just an excuse, I think. Is there any evidence that people look at an advert, for example, on, on a bus or something like that and think, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go away and spend all of my wage. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? It's about having evidence-based policy. And obviously, everybody sympathises with the, you know, the guys who set up gambling with lives. People do commit suicide over gambling, as they do over many things, let's be frank, and any, particularly anything involving um, you know, getting into serious debt. It's a sad thing. But I think also it's a relatively rare and endemic thing. And the question is, as you kind of asked there, is what is the connection with gambling sponsorship? What's the connection with gambling advertising? What's even the connection with affordability checks? How, how even are you going to have affordability checks without some kind of big brother element to it? So I understand why people who have you know, been, been, been problem gamblers in the past or no problem gamblers who've got in, themselves into serious trouble, up to and including suicide, I understand why they, they feel. Uh, that there, there needs to be change, but the change has to be based on evidence. The House of Lords looked at this a few years ago. The House of Lords is incredibly anti-gambling. They're constantly bringing up um, sort of private members' bills against gambling. They even they couldn't find any ev evidence that advertising and gambling sponsorship were connected in any way to problem gambling, let alone right really severe problem gambling. So we need to look at the evidence here. And traditionally, when it comes to gambling in this country, we haven't. And Chris, just if you give a brief reply to this, if I think about alcoholism as one example, you know, my family have a history of it, actually, and the North East is a region that does suffer from alcoholism. I wouldn't propose banning all alcohol, right? This is the sort of direction that we appear to be moving in, in my opinion, which is one that actually says personal responsibility isn't worth a damn. The state should dictate what you do with your life. Yeah, I mean, the, the current statistics suggest that about 0.2% of the adult population are problem gamblers. And I'm not saying problem gambling isn't an issue at all. Obviously, it is. But there's a much larger proportion of drinkers are alcoholics. And there are ways to get over that. And, and you have people who give up drinking. But most of them don't tend to say, you know, I was an alcoholic, therefore we should close down the pubs. Or we should, you know, close the pubs at 8 o'clock or we should double the price of alcohol. Most uh Ex-alcoholics understand it's a it was a kind of psychological problem for them, which they overcame. That is also true of most problem gamblers. But there are some problem gamblers who, unfortunately, still this you know they can't let it go, and it has to be somebody else's fault. And we need to understand problem gambling, as with alcoholism and other psychiatric or psychological problems, as being problems of the individual. They're not going to be solved generally by the state. OK, Chris, we'll leave it there. That was the head of lifestyle economics at the IEA, Christopher Snowden. I thank you for your time. The writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters is with me until four o'clock. Charlie, do you see this, the Conservative Party, as a, it used to be viewed as a vehicle of, of protecting, of jealously guarding mm. freedom? Mm. Do you still see it as such? Oh, no, that, that flame of liberty was uh, long dying out, I think it's fair to say. And, and I think this is part of a, a wider trend we've seen, especially in the recent premierships for the Conservative Party, where it, it creates lifestyle policy based on the experiences of an extreme minority. We're talking there with Chris about um, the number of people who are problem gamblers being 0.2%. You know, it's a tiny portion. Mm -hmm. But as a consequence of this problem and the devastation it wrecks on so many lives, which is utterly miserable, everyone else has to change their lifestyles to incorporate that. And we shouldn't do that in, in other areas of lifestyles. You know? um, we shouldn't have to 
you know, ban cycling or because some people get hit. Or we shouldn't have to uh, adjust our movements because some people have disabilities that, you know, you might knock into in the road or something like that. I mean, any time where you organise policy based on a minority experience as the lead role of how it should be changed, I think you get for overreach and you start to deny freedom. And we've seen this in so many other parts of the Conservative Party. And Chris policy. mentioned the, the aspect of the fact that this is, if you are a problem gambler, mm. you have what could be deemed a mental health problem, Precisely. right? So therefore, should there not just be better access to mental health treatment for problem gamblers mm. instead of, and I actually quite like the way you can sign up to ban yourself from gambling. Precisely. I think that's great. Those sort of measures seem much more proportionate mm. to the problem, as you rightly say, the problem being a, a minority issue. Yes, and I, I think we see this across a, a whole wide range of lifestyle issues now, don't we? Now, I, I personally, quite like a sugary energy drink when I'm hungover. But unfortunately, due to changes in sugar tax law, we all have to be punished because there's a, a, a so-called endemic of uh, obesity. Everyone else who drinks sugary drinks responsibly, and it sounds like a crazy thing to say, has to be punished in this way, which is highly regrettable. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Charlie Peters there with more soundness and common sense. <laughs> You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Next, we'll be discussing whether the heatwave warning for the UK is a cause for concern, or is it being blown out of all proportion? But now, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Simon Pusey. Hello, it's 3.33. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB Newsroom. People are being advised to travel only if it's absolutely necessary until Tuesday. Train firm Avanti West Coast have updated their advice following extreme temperature forecasts over the next two days. The health secretary has said extra measures are being put in place for ambulances, with an amber extreme heat warning in for most of Britain today, and the first red alert for tomorrow and Tuesday covering a large part of England. Europe continues to be gripped by the extreme heat wave too, with fires raging through northeastern Italy. Firefighters have been battling wildfires over the weekend. One broke out near Rome, with flames reaching the town's centre, forcing families to evacuate as a precautionary measure. Rivers and reservoirs are drying up across the country, adding to the worst drought the country has seen in 70 years. Temperatures are expected to hit 42 degrees Celsius in many northern Italian cities next week. A man found dead in an Italian hotel room has been named as the former professional rugby player Ricky Bibby. He was discovered yesterday morning next to a seriously hurt 43-year-old woman thought to be his partner. She's being treated in hospital while investigators try to figure out what happened. Bibby played professional rugby for more than a decade, including a time with Wigan Warriors, until an injury forced him to retire in 2012. The cabinet minister who led last year's UN Climate Change Summit says he could resign if the next prime minister is not fully committed to the net zero agenda. COP26 President Alok Sharma told the Observer newspaper that some Tory leader candidates had called what he called lukewarm emission on emissions targets. He urged them to set out their support for the net zero strategy. The second televised leadership debate will take place tonight. TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? 
things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. The UK is bracing itself for days of heat with an amber warning in place and a new red alert likely for England from tomorrow with record temperatures which could reach as high as 41 Celsius. The amber warning reckons health problems are more likely for some. Substantial changes are required to work and routines. Water safety incidents could increase as people head to the coast and transport delays are possible. But with warnings right of these rising temperatures, my next guest, one of them, has taken to social media to put forward his case as to why the concerns of the world becoming too hot are, in his view, exaggerated. So Alex Epstein is the, an American author and president of the Centre for Industrial Progress, who has a new book out, Fossil Future, by the way. And Dr Judith Anderson is the chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance. And of course, the writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters joins me in the studio. Alex, can you just set out for me why you believe these claims that actually we're seeing the end of days, these apocalyptic warnings of the heat becoming too much to handle are unfounded or unjustifiable? Sure. And I just think we need to put this in the context of these are concerns about fossil fuel use. So when you think of fossil fuel use, just like if you think about prescription drug use, you need to think about the benefits and the side effects. And that includes the consequences of losing the benefits. And I think right now what we need to be talking about is losing the benefits of fossil fuels thanks to idiotic policies by America, by the UK, around the world that's creating shortages, that's creating starvation, that's creating the inability to afford air conditioning, and that in the winter is threatening to freeze many, many people to death. So that's the context here is people complaining about the heat are saying we need to use less fossil fuel, and that's actually made it more difficult to deal with the heat. Now on to directly your question, heat-related deaths are far lower than cold-related deaths around the world. That's a fact. In general, disaster deaths have gone way down, thanks in large part to fossil fuel industry and development. So this is the context. Also, warming tends to warm more in colder regions. So you, if you look at the whole thing objectively, fossil fuels are so crucial, and the real threat is the movement against fossil fuels that's already causing a global energy crisis and threatens to make it much worse. In both Sri Lanka and, of course, with the Dutch farmers' most recent rebellion, do you actually see the way in which this, this attempt to curtail the progress that we've made, you know, farmers could no longer emit a certain amount of, of, of emissions and, of course, with the, the land grab, essentially, to try and curtail those emissions. And in Sri Lanka, the new Green Deal that was put in place there appears to have gone down like a bag of sick. Do you actually worry that you are losing this debate? Well, I mean, it, yeah, in terms of what's happening that's around the doctor, world, these sorry, countries... Sorry, Alex, that's to Dr. Judith oh, I'm Anderson. Sorry. That's quite I'm all right. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Darren, I didn't realise that was to me. Quite all right. Um, I think what Alex is missing uh, is the 8.7 million people who die from the pollution related to fossil fuels. So that's one thing that's really important to say. Um, but also... Um, I absolutely agree. I think where we can both agree is that extremes, either cold or hot, are no good for the human body or the animal body. Cows get heat stress above 22 degrees, actually. Um, and so we need to think very carefully, particularly about the most vulnerable. Um, in the heat wave in, um, <clears throat> in, in Europe in 2003, 72,000 people died. And most of those, many of those were elderly or vulnerable people. And of course, the problem is the planet is actually getting hotter if we are to believe the IPCC, which is a multinational agency where all countries have agreed. 
And I also think it's really important for Alex to take notice of multiple multinational public health experts who've been publishing uh, in places like The Lancet, showing what the heat effects of okay. climate change are. Thank you, Judith. Alex, I just want to let you come back to that briefly, if you would. Sure. I mean, so the pollution thing, this is, you can read more about it in Fossil Future, but basically the 8.7 is a total distortion. There's a huge range of these. And the benefits of fossil fuels vastly increase life expectancy. That's why you have all these alleged deaths in China, and yet life expectancy is 80 in many places. Uh, I think the main thing is Judith is ignoring my basic point about the benefits of fossil fuels to deal with heat and cold. She and that movement ignore the fact that climate-related disaster deaths are at all-time lows. And in terms of The Lancet, if you look at their data, they expect uh, cold-related deaths going forward, uh, loss, like fewer cold-related deaths to actually save more lives than more heat-related deaths uh, take. So in general, just fossil fuels are so crucial, and the only way to not recognize that is to just ignore their huge benefits and fo focus out of context on heat danger. Okay, Charlie Peters in the studio with me. Poor Alex is up very early in California. But what's your view, Charlie? Well, it's true, of course, that some people are harmed by extreme weather patterns. But the fact remains that the best part of a billion people around the world are still living in extreme poverty, according to the UN. That's people living on less than a dollar and 20 cents every single day. That is an unacceptable number. Fossil fuels are vital for us to achieve human emancipation from poverty, for economic development, and for people to enjoy the levels of technological innovation and advancement that we enjoy in the West. Now, it's certainly the case that climate disasters and these struggles cause deaths around the world. But as countries become more developed, the number of deaths from climate disasters goes down enormously. There's been something like a 98% reduction in deaths from climate disasters in the last century. Now, last month, there was an earthquake in Afghanistan. It killed thousands. But if you look into modern countries such as Japan, they have modern buildings, warning systems, all the things that fossil fuels and carbon emissions have given us through technological advancement that allows us to prepare and defend against these disasters. That's what I want for the whole world, and that's why I'm in favour of fossil fuels. So, Judith, do you accept that? Do you accept that climate change is happening, it's going to be inevitable, and therefore we've just got to make ourselves more resilient to the effects of it, like heat? Well, the increase, if we don't do anything, actually, the world, uh, and this isn't me speaking, this is Sir David King, the former chief scientist, uh, and other people, we head for an uninhabitable future in some parts of the world, and particularly in the global south. Um, I also think there are many areas where countries can actually jump the fossil fuel era uh, and move into more sustainable energy in a very effective way. Uh, for example, if you use solar-powered uh, cooking, then you save many people's deaths from cooking in uh, kerosene, for ex cooking with kerosene, for example. Um, I do think the fossil fuel industry has given us many benefits. Absolutely. Uh, we rely on it so much. But the disadvantage is the CO2 emissions. And we have to take notice of that and find ways to reduce uh, in a way that is equitable and just. And that's where, I, that's where I agree with your speaker about poverty. We have to take seriously poverty, uh, and we have to really uh, look at how renewals, renewables can be scaled up. OK, Alex, would you accept that? What we need to do now is go hell for leather on renewables in order to actually bring down our carbon emissions. No, definitely not. What you want insofar as you want to deal with CO2 emissions is you want innovation that makes low-cost, low-carbon energy scalable. Here, I really advocate liberating and decriminalizing nuclear. The green movement's criminalization of nuclear has been a moral crime, and that's really held back lower-carbon energy. But you have to recognize that, as we heard before, just the world is desperately short of energy. Getting more energy to more people is the highest priority. That's going to require more fossil fuels in the near term, not less 
less going, I forget we said hell leather for renewables, What that's already caused a global energy crisis. So I think that Judith and that movement need to recognize they've already made billions of lives more miserable around the world. They're threatening to starve people. And it's not enough to just say, oh, we need renewables. You need to, you can only do that if they're truly, if and when they're truly cost effective. And it's part of a growing energy uh, presence in the world. And so, yeah, we need more fossil fuels. That's the bottom line. Judith, I just I would like you to come back to that. Well, it's not what my colleagues in South Africa and Nigeria are telling me. Um, and I think this is a longer debate. We're talking about this in much too uh, brief terms. But I think you have to ask those countries, is that actually what they want? So, Charlie, would Mine you are telling agree? me they need more energy and they don't want to be poor. That's what they tell me. Yeah. Charlie, do you, do you agree with that? No, I, I believe that humans will eventually solve the problems caused uh, by our energy gap. I believe in humanity. I think humanity is underrated. Humans have encountered so many struggles and we overcome them with technology and innovation. We're not there yet. And the idea that we should force to, to the renewable stage now is, I think, insane thinking and very damaging thinking that will cost millions of lives. Instead, what we should do is do everything we can to scale up renewables, but while that's still doing, while we're still waiting for that technology to break through and those geniuses to take that leap forward, let's use what we've got. OK, we'll have to leave it there, folks. But I must say it is refreshing to actually have this conversation because other broadcasters just won't even countenance doing it in the first place. So that was Alex Epstein there, an American author of Fossil Future and president of the Centre for Industrial Progress, and Dr Judith Anderson, the chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance, and, of course, Charlie Peters with me in the studio. Now, folks, new figures suggest ambulance response times are at an all-time high, with the average wait at now at over 50 minutes for heart attacks and strokes, when, of course, you need an ambulance there as soon as possible. That's well above the target of 18 minutes. The Royal College of Nursing survey also found that 63% of staff reported emergency care taking place in corridors and waiting rooms rather than on wards. That's pretty damning indictment of the current NHS. The NHS England performance figures also found that once a patient had reached accident and emergency, over 22,000 of them had to wait more than 12 hours to be admitted. So can we still trust the health service we are ultimately all funding? Well, joining me now to discuss this is the former health secretary, Stephen Dorrell. Stephen, I thank you very much for your time. Why are we seeing these huge waiting times for both ambulances and waiting lists, which really do put the fear of God into my viewers who passionately believe in the NHS, but don't understand why, when we're spending so much more money on it, that these things are still taking place? Well, you're absolutely right to say that there is huge pressure on the health service, and you correctly identify that that's partly on the emergency services, ambulance services, but also, of course, people who arrive at hospital through A&E. That's one part of it. And there's also huge pressure on waiting lists. We've seen figures published recently. These are not people who need emergency care, but for whom, uh, who are on a waiting list for planned care. Both groups uh, arriving in hospital are under, the, the hospital system is under huge demand. The question is what the health service needs to do about it. Uh, and there are several things it needs to do about it. The first and most obvious is that those people who are currently in hospital but could be discharged if social care was in a better condition, we need to address the crisis in social care because until we can discharge people who don't need to be in hospital, we will continue to have pressure for people waiting to come into hospital. The other key area which, I, which the government, in fairness, talks about, but which we haven't seen enough action on, is ensuring that there are proper primary community-based services that prevent people needing to come into hospital in the first place. The health service too often works on the principle that we'll wait till you're ill enough to qualify to come in rather than intervening to prevent you to becoming ill in the first place. Yes, because, Stephen, a lot of my viewers as well will be saying, well, look, you've just mentioned their social care, which is, as you say, taking not a lot of bandwidth, taking up a lot of bandwidth, rather, within the NHS itself. Has the Conservative Party kicked the social care can down the road yet again, in your view? Uh, well, the short answer to your question is yes. 
I was Secretary of State for Health in the 1990s. Social care was in a, I wouldn't say crisis, but it was under extreme pressure in the 1990s. And both Labour and Tory governments since then have kicked the can down the road rather than addressing the need for properly joined up uh, social care, community health, primary health. Uh, what is the difference, for goodness sake, between a nurse who works in a GP surgery or a nurse who works in the community health service and a nurse who works in the uh, social care system? We've got three different bureaucracies that don't talk to each other. And until we, jo until we address that and focus on prevention and early intervention, we will continue to have unmanageable pressure in the emergency rooms of our hospitals and will continue to be unable to deal with peaks of demand, such as the peak of demand we're likely to see in hospitals over the next 48 hours, uh, partly caused by the heat wave. That's because, Stephen, uh, in my view, I just believe that actually we need to talk about fundamental reform, and that's not a lurch to any American-style system, but we need a conversation, in my view, about the fundamentals of delivering for people. Because as far as the NHS is concerned within global, compared to global comparisons, basically, the NHS isn't very good at that fundamental job of keeping people alive as far as healthcare outcomes are concerned. That's, uh, that's uh, well, it's right and it's wrong, if I may say so. OK. The, the area where the health service uh, scores relatively well by international standards is in the principle that if you're in urgent need, uh, albeit there are pressures that we've been talking about, if you're in urgent need, uh, the, the health service is usually there for you. OK. What it's not good at is delivering outcomes that compare favourably in terms of the, the, the life experience of the people that it should be there yes. to help. Yeah. And that's partly, well, I think that's importantly, because we think of the health service as something different from social care. We're also too often, think we think of the hospital system as something different from GP services. What we need is a more joined up approach to public services that serve a community. And as I say, recognizes that when people uh, th th there are many there are many opportunities yeah. that if we f we structured ourselves to do it we could improve people's life chances improve people's experience of life without uh, and that's uh, what and, it's and all reduce about reduce the emergency, the emergency yeah. demands that that leads that uh, we currently experience in the health service okay we'll leave it there stephen dorrell the former health secretary thank you very much for your time and contribution now folks it's 353 where and change once again within the church of england vicars have told the church that asking worshippers to all stand and all kneel is unfair on the disabled and have urged prayer books to be rewritten so the language is deemed more inclusive andrew williams the chief executive of Christian Concern criticised the move and said, are we becoming so fearful and sensitive that we are prepared to do away with words and traditions that have always been properly understood within their context? So is the Church of England losing its way? I have a feeling I know the answer to that question of my next, next guest, Gavin Ashenden, a former Anglican bishop who converted to Catholicism in 2019. Gavin... Common book of prayer, right, fantastic, absolutely beautiful to, to even just to go through, in my opinion. I would be profoundly upset at any idea that we have to fundamentally rethink these things just because of a few people have said, I'm offended, who frankly probably don't even go to church. I think there are two difficulties. Uh, they're both very serious. Uh, one is that the, the nature of the religion is changing. Uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a religion of the nice and, and, uh, and, and victimhood. And the other is infantilizing people. Um, I mean, if I, if, if, if I had a stroke, uh, which may happen one day, and I had to go into church in a wheelchair and someone said, please stand or kneel, I'd be sorry I had a stroke, but I wouldn't have a meltdown that I couldn't join in. It's simply a matter of Andrea Williams said of common sense. Um, I just, what's so sad is, is that, um, the, the, the church has become one more organization where people have been captured by this new ideology. Jordan Peterson talks about people being possessed by ideas. And it's as if normal, sensible people have been overtaken by an idiocy. And, and it, it matters. It's not just about laughing at them, as you and I actually should properly do, because I think the best answer is laughter. It's so silly. But the, the problem is 
I think the world needs Christianity. It needs Jesus. It needs people whose lives are transformed. It needs people who have an experience of God so they learn to love and forgive and turn the other cheek. Um, they're different kinds of people and they're worth having. To lose the whole thing because you want to concentrate on making people feel not excluded is to so badly miss a plot. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. Gavin Ashenden, we are going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because my big gob has let proceedings go on a little bit too long. But that was Gavin Ashenden, a former Anglican bishop who converted to Catholicism in 2019. You have very kindly been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I thank you very much for your company and, of course, to Charlie Peters here in the studio. This show is on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 o'clock. But for now, folks, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking dry for most of us and it should stay warm in the late evening sunshine. Let's take a look at the details. It's a dry end to the day in southwest England with plenty of sunshine. It will be slightly breezier around the coast but feeling warm inland. Southeast England will hold on to plenty of sunshine this evening. It will feel warm late into the evening with light winds staying dry also into Wales to end the day with lots of very late sunshine, a thin layer of cloud that will turn the sunshine hazy at times. A fine end to the day across the Midlands with light winds and evening sunshine. It will feel rather warm this evening with temperatures in the mid 20s. Skies will be a little cloudier though in Northern England, although there will be some sunny breaks at times. Staying warm this evening, but feeling fresher on the coast. Largely cloudy to end the day in Scotland with some patchy rain in the far north. Warmer weather will hang on in the south tonight, but feeling cooler elsewhere. A dry end to the day also in Northern Ireland with hazy sunshine. Winds will be light with temperatures in the high teens. Staying warm for many places tonight ahead of a very hot day on Monday. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And